Hello, today I'm going to talk about how data is written to a floppy disk, specifically the 3.5 inch floppy disk used by the Amiga and the PC. So let's take a look. The first thing we need to understand is data encoding. Your binary files aren't literally written to the disk in their raw form, they're encoded into a suitable format and then written. You may have heard of the following terms, FM, also known as frequency modulation, MFM, known as Modified Frequency Modulation, used typically by the PC and the Amiga, and GCR, Group Coded Recording, used by early Apple and Commodore systems, although the Amiga did support this also. By today's standards, these encoding schemes are all obsolete. However, for the purpose of this video, we're going to take a look at MFM, being the main encoding format used by my favourite retro machine, the Amiga. But before we talk about encoding, we need to talk about how data is physically stored on the disk. The disk surface is coated with a medium that can be magnetised, much like an audio cassette tape. The drive head can only detect changes in magnetic fields, i.e. changing the direction of the magnetic field. This would be like holding a magnet in your hand and turning it round. The disk surface, however, can be thought of as lots of magnets all lined up next to each other, each pointing in the opposite direction to the previous. This picture illustrates those changing directions by using different colours. When the direction changes, the drive can detect it. These changes are typically referred to as flux transitions. When the drive detects one of these transitions, it briefly sends out a short pulse on its read data line, and as the disk continues to spin, you receive a sequence of these pulses. This isn't binary ones and zeros, this is just a sequence of pulses, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. But if the disk has a series of magnets on it like this, how can it be double-sided? Surely the top and the bottom sides would interfere with each other. Well, this is actually very simple. The drive heads for reading the upper and lower side of the disc aren't actually in exactly the same place. One is set back slightly further than the other one, so the upper and lower tracks don't actually overlap. All discs are different, as a result of being encoded and written on different drives, and therefore the strength of these little tiny magnets can vary from disc to disc. They also degrade slowly over time. For example, a professionally mastered disc will usually have much stronger magnetic information than discs written on a domestic drive. So how does this work? The floppy drive includes special circuit called an auto gain amplifier. Auto gain is something you will have experienced but without realising what it was. Have you ever been on a call with someone and noticed the background hiss noise gets louder and louder when no one is talking? That's the auto gain. The idea is very simple. The drive head has an amplifier connected to it, which is controlled automatically. When no flux transitions are occurring, the amplifier slowly turns up the volume more and more until a flux transition is encountered. If nothing is encountered, this volume gets louder and louder until the background noise actually detects a flux transition. This is why an unformatted disc looks like random data, as each time it's read, the amplifier is at a different level and the background noise is random. When a signal is detected, the amplifier slowly turns down, and after a few transitions this will usually settle out to a suitable level. But how fast should this amplifier change the volume? If it's too slow, we may never read the data properly but if it's too fast, we may constantly read random noise. This is where the encoding specification comes in. In this case, PC and Amiga floppy drives expect the data to be MFM encoded. But what is MFM encoding? MFM, short for Modified Frequency Modulation, is an encoding scheme that derives from the NRZI, or Non-Return to Zero Inverted Scheme. Don't worry, it's not as complex as it sounds. NRZI encoding schemes require some kind of signal for example, our flux transition signal, to be received at specific time intervals, which we'll call a clock interval or clock boundary. The scheme decodes binary bits by looking to see if one of these flux transitions was present or missing during one of these intervals. Following so far? MFM builds on this notion by encoding binary data such that the time between each flux transition is within a minimum and maximum time. These are the rules that are used to control how the auto gain circuit should work. The way in which the data is encoded is as follows. A binary 1 is always encoded as 0, 1, i.e. no flux transition and then a flux transition in each of the clock intervals. A binary 0, however, is encoded differently depending on what happened in the previous clock interval. If in the last interval there was a flux transition, then this is encoded as 0, 0. If, however, the last interval was not a flux transition, then this is encoded as 1, 0. By following these rules, it's impossible to have two flux transitions next to each other 
and impossible for a flux transition to be any further away than four clock intervals. I'm going to put you to the test. Pause the video and see if you can encode the following sequence. Did you get it right? You should have ended up with this. So we know the data format, but what about the actual timing? Well for double density disks, each of these clock intervals is 2 microseconds, meaning that 0, 1 takes 4 microseconds to encode. For a high density disk however, the timings change. Each of these clock intervals is 1 microsecond apart, meaning that 0, 1 takes 2 microseconds to encode, hence it's at double the rate meaning you can store twice as much data in the same space. Back to the drive, this means the auto gain amplifier ramps up twice as quick as it does compared to the double density disk. That's why there's a hole in the corner of the high density disks. Not only on some drives can it output a signal to say if the disk is double density or high density, but it also affects the internal timings used too. This is the main reason why you could easily use a high density disk on a double density disk drive as a double density disk without any problems, but had to cover the hole when inserting the disk into a high density drive again. Sounds so good so far, but things are never quite that simple. In the real world, the drive is supposed to spin at 300 revs per minute, but it won't be exactly, and the specification usually allows for this to slip by as much as 10%. Not only that, but lower quality drives, and specifically older ones, don't even spin the disc at a consistent speed all the way around. If it was bad when it was written to, then imagine how much worse it could be when read back on an equally bad drive. The speed the disc spins at directly affects the speed of the flux transitions that are being read or written. But if we're expecting flux transitions to occur at a specific exact interval, how can the data be recovered properly? Surely over time these flux transitions would miss the clock interval. Enter the PLL, or phased lock loop. The idea here is we assume that we know the ideal clock interval, for example 2 microseconds, and as we start receiving data from the drive, we adjust this interval by small amounts to ensure that we get the flux transitions to occur at the right clock interval. A timing error is calculated every time there's a flux transition, and this information is fed back in again to adjust the clock speed. For example, if transitions start to occur more quickly than expected, then the clock speed is decreased. However, if the transitions start to occur too slowly, then we increase the clock interval. And finally, if nothing's detected, we gradually return the clock interval back to the default. This works perfectly fine as long as the disk spins within a suitable tolerance. Outside of this, the PLL eventually can't compensate and the data starts to get corrupted. So the disk spinning and data is being received, but how does the computer know where the data starts and where it finishes? Well it turns out there's several methods used. Every floppy drive has some kind of sensor to detect when the disk passes a certain point. This generates a signal, known as the index pulse, and should be consistent across all the drives. This is typically done with a magnetic sensor. Other drives, however, rely on a physical hole on the disk itself. As the disk is spun, a light is shone through the hole, and if it's detected the other side, then the drive knows it's reached this point. Aside from physical signals from the drive, there is also a signal encoded into the data itself, known as the sync mark. The sync mark, or sync word, is a sequence that's impossible to encode using MFM, because it violates the specification, and therefore could never occur in the actual data. However, it's still fully readable by the drive. The typical sync word used is hex 4489, which in binary looks like this. When trying to decode this as MFM, you end up with the following bit sequence, which in hex is decoded as A1. If you were to try and encode A1 as MFM, you get the following sequence. Notice how there's one bit different. Because of this trick, it's really easy to look out for this in the data stream. The last thing I want to talk about is write precompensation. This is a technique used to subtly adjust the time when flux transitions are written to disk. The reason for doing this is as we move closer to the centre of the disk, these little magnets get closer and closer. And as I'm sure you're aware, magnets like to attract and repel each other. Because of this attracting and repelling, the idea behind write precompensation is to slightly delay or advance the exact timings of these flux transitions to compensate for this attracting and repelling so that when the data is actually read back again, it appears at the right time. To do this, however, you require knowledge of the data you've just sent and the data you're about to send. Floppy disk controllers on the PC and the hardware registers on the Amiga can do this for you.
This is some of the collective knowledge I've used and gained over the last few years creating Drawbridge, an Arduino device that reads and writes Amiga formatted disks from a PC. A standard PC couldn't do this because of the way the floppy controller was built just to read PC formatted disks and so it couldn't understand any other format. I started Drawridge back in 2017 when there weren't really any other cost effective solutions available. These days however, there's many affordable options, each with their own merits and I'm working on making as many of them compatible with the work I did with Floppy Bridge to allow real time disk access on Amiga emulators like WinUAE. Well I hope you found that informative if not interesting. Next time we're going to take a look at copy protection and see the different methods that software publishers and software developers use to stop you copying those disks. If you don't want to miss that video, then I suggest subscribing to my YouTube channel. Also, you might want to consider joining me and supporting me on Patreon. I'll see you next time.